most Toyota Prados or Land Cruisers that have the back hinged. <laughs> Originally spun off the hard working 70 series Land Cruiser, the Prado was developed as a smaller Land Cruiser and carried the Cruiser name tag for good reason, retaining its durable, off road capable leather frame chassis with independent front suspension combined with a live rear axle that makes the drive lack the sharpness of some of its rivals, partly due to Toyota adopting a rather soft suspension that put comfort and wheel travel before driving dynamics. It was mainly bought by town folks who still wanted a tough and reliable SUV, being that the Big Daddy Cruiser had grown too large for some people's needs and the city streets. You can get the Prado in a three-door body style and in some markets as a Lexus. The Prado stands out in the market by having seats for eight, while most of SUVs will sit on seven. In its standard form, it's not a hard four-wheel drive, but with a bit of aftermarket wizardry, with bottom accessories, it can easily transform into one. For trims, you got different letterings for different regions where the product was sold. So here's what you need to know. This look has been the Prado 203 to 209. And for us guys who buy secondhand cars, it still holds its status as a very desirable car. So what do we get from the back? Starting from the bottom, you have your spare wheel tucked underneath the car. Fun fact, most Prados or Land Cruisers that have the back hinged spare tire come from Australia. And these other ones are either from Japan or UK. You have your spare wheel on the back and space for an extra tank of fuel underneath where this spare tire is as of now. You get your Land Cruiser Prado, which is the model designation or the frame put on this chassis. And the TZ, which is your trim indicator. This being a Japanese model, you get the TZ at the back. If it's the Australian version, the VX is just the equivalent of the TZ in Japan. The boot opens horizontally. And if you don't lock it, it would come and try backstab you as you're putting things into the back like that. So locking it is this bit here at the bottom. And I like that it's mechanical. So if you're holding something or you're carrying something and the door has tried to yeah, rear end you, you can push back to the end, then you kick it in and it locks. On your door, you get a net. This one is, is dead and, and forgotten. It just needs a new net or you put other tabs at the top to attach it. Under here is where you usually have your, your spare tire service kit. If you're buying one of these cars, look for such things because guys tend to steal these and sell them and resell them to you once you go to buy to buy the same things. If you're buying this car, check that you have your tools. It might not be the owner's fault for not having the tools, but having them there is a plus. Let's lock that. The only downside to this is your third row seats fold on the sides. They eat some space on the sides of the boot. Lowering the third row seats from the back is easy. All you have to do is close this bit, the strap gets loose, you can unclip it, and it has a space here to put your clip. Pull this part up, so you do that, then you drop the seat, it locks in, you pull the backrest and that locks in too, and you have your third row seat. If you want to remove the whole seat and keep it at home, it's possible. You get to remove the plastic on the side of the seat, and you get a red button, you push on that, it unlocks and you can remove the seat. On the left hand side you get your jack, on the right hand side you just get a vent, you get tethering points on all four corners. These ones are susceptible to rust because the lower part is usually not coated. If not used regularly, they become hard. A bit of W40 would work that out and you'd fix that problem. The second row seats fold in a 40-60 manner. You can drop them further to create more space and be able to put more items here at the back. Getting to the back seat is made easy. You have a step on the outside of the car and a secondary step here inside the car to help you step in. Having a tall white door makes it easy on entry and exit. So getting in, the feel of the door, 
you get a bit of rattle inside the door, but it sounds solid. Comparing this to the full-size Land Cruiser, the first thing I notice is the floor of the car feels lower. All the seats have been raised higher. On the Land Cruiser, you feel like your knees are a bit higher. I don't know how that works, really. Getting comfortable, I have a lot of headspace. And this seat pushed back way past my sitting position. I still have space for my knees. Unless I slouch, then I'll touch the seat back. A good feature on the back seat is that they recline. You pull a lever and you can recline them all the way nearly flat. You can push the front seat forward a bit, remove the headrest, lower the backrest and have yourself a bed here in the Land Cruiser. If I talk about wear and tear, the only kind of wear I'm seeing is stretching material on some bits, especially on the part that you have your bum usually and the area that folds in when the seat has been dropped. I can't remember the name of this stuff, but you know how when your sweater has those furry balls on your elbows or something because of wear, that has happened on the seat here. I don't know if this is shavable, as I've seen TikTok videos of guys shaving those bits off and having a clean sweater. That's what's happened here in the materials. The center bit, if you drop it down, you get your armrest and the armrest it pops out and the bottom drops. You can't put big bottles of water here. I'm going to directly compare this to the Toyota Hilux Surf because they're more or less the same car. So moving on to the center seat, I have enough headspace, I have enough knee space, and the seat, remember, the driver's seat is pushed back further than my driving position. And I still have space to wiggle my, my feet. The foot space feels better than the Surf. The Surf feels roomier than this Prado I'm in right now. For cabin space, you have small door pockets, which are way smaller than what was there on the Toyota Hilux Surf. You get this cloth, backseat pocket on both sides of the seats and a bit of storage here at the center. For connectivity, there is no way to connect to anything here at the back. Back then anyway, this car being a 203 model, children didn't have phones to charge here at the back. But at least you got your rear AC controls to control your own temperature at the back other than having the front adults taking care of you on that, on that side of things. This is a cut higher compared to the Forerunner. The Forerunner felt more utilitarian. This one feels more luxurious. That's the difference you get on those two models. Getting to the front seat, the door opens wide, Visuri. You have a grab handle to help you with getting in and a step for the Moshimiwa bit if you're feeling Moshimiwa-ish. On the door, it's similar to the back where you have a small side door pocket, no bottle holders, just a massive speaker system that's taken most of this real estate here on your door. The seats are manual, except the lumbar support, which is your back support in this TZ. It's a big car, yes, but even a small bodied person can still drive this car. The steering wheel is telescopic, meaning it can come forward and back, and it tilts up and down with a secondary switch here that if you pull on that, drops or it goes up and you can set it at whatever level you want your steering wheel to be. Getting in, you can hear all those squeaks happening like on the seat. That flex there and the door a bit. It shows you, it does things to everyone. getting comfortable I have a lot of headspace even though we have a sunroof on this car still a lot of headspace I have a lot of real estate space here on the driver's seat the gauge cluster is a bit dark when the car is off you can see the rings that separate each component there when it's off but when you turn it on they all light up what do I get here you have your multimedia system here at the top your AC controls and an aftermarket stereo system here at the bottom. How do you know what top trim you have? On the top trim, you get heated seats at the front and your side mirrors are usually heated. So these blank switches here probably have that. Moving back, you get your full drive shift knob, gear shift selector, handbrake. The center armrest is wide and both passengers can have their hands here with no one infringing on the other person's space. For practicality, it's not as practical as the Tota Hilux Surf, but this one, still has enough space really. You get a sizable glove box and a six CD changer. While on the surf, you got a privacy lock here at the top. And the bottom bit is lent in felt, but the other side is still plastic. I wonder why they did that. Skimping. 
the armrest is adjustable. If you release it, it springs forward all the way and you can choose where to have it. You open the top bit, a very large center armrest storage. On the top trim level, you get a fridge in here. But on this one, it's just a space for storage. This port here, you can actually buy tissue from Toyota and fit it in here to just pull out your tissue from this hole here. To get two cup holders, which can be which you can still remove the divider and have just a um, singular storage for whatever. It's big enough without the separator, but if I put the separator in and try fit my fist as I did with the Toyota Hilux Surf, I can't fit my fist. So Surf wins that. For connectivity, you have a 12 volt, 120 watts port and a cigarette lighter here onto your left. You get your sunglasses holder here at the top. It's lined in carpet too, so you'll keep your sunglasses safe and you get a sunroof up top. Sunroofs at this edge and point have issues of leaking or not working. It's still fixable because you have the aftermarket bits for rubbers to seal the sunroof and you can still get mechanisms. If any of the mechanisms inside the sunroof broke or something, you can still fix them and get your sunroof to work again. For wear and tear, the part that has the most visible are the seats, the fabric seats, and the dashboard. This is very common with this model of Toyota. So you either spend a lot of money to fix it, or you just forget about it and live with it as it is, which most people do. Open the bonnet is done from under here. You flick your wrist, similar to the Hilux Surf. You press on the right hand side of the Toyota logo, and having gas struts is a plus to hold up your big bonnet. You get a choice of manual and auto transmission, and it came with Toyota's capable part-time four-wheel drive system with a useful low range when in the bundles. The 23 Prado came out with three engine options. If you're looking to get one of these second hand, just know the four-cylinder engines are very underpowered for such a heavy car. The turbo diesel has only 128 horsepower, but likely makes up for that in torque with 252 pound-foot of torque at 2,000 revs. The V6 engine is the most recommended. It has plenty of punch for decent performance on and off-road with almost 241 horsepower and 277 pound-foot of torque, but it also is quite fast. Averaging about 13 to 15 liters per 100 kilometers around town. It's better on long trips, dropping down to around 11, but take it for some serious off-road or tow something heavy, and that number will increase significantly. Enjoying this content, share it as much as you can, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Total's reliability is well justified and have proved to be durable and reliable in the hands of their owners. But no car is immune from problems, even Toyota. The Land Cruiser Prado has had a few issues that you as a potential owner need to be aware of, such as cracked dashes, cracking of the rear boot door, coolant contaminating the transmission fluid, leaking injectors on diesel engines, and such. Just pause and read through to get a better picture. Safety-wise, Red Car lists Prado. 13 to 11 as having a four star and cup safety rating. Standard safety features include front, side, and curtain airbags. The electronic stability control and electronic brake force distribution is an option. To identify if it's optional on the car, turn on the ignition and look for a VDC light on the gauge cluster. The Prado is a blend of civilized on road manners and solid off road performance, making it very attractive to a lot of people. But check for the issues that are listed. Buying a second-hand Prado that does not be off-road is still quite possible. But just do your due diligence to spot the obvious signs of one that has been battered off-road. If you do buy one that has not been off-road, please take it off-road. Let it and you have a taste of its potential. At the end of the day, the Prado is a comfortable, reasonably sized family adventure car that will take you into the unknown and bring you back with no stress.